through 16. Can we stand for the reading of God's word? Then Nathan departed to his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and it became ill. David therefore pleaded with God for the child, the chi and David fasted and went in and laid all night on the ground. You may be seated. Thank you. Okay, happy Sabbath. Uh, I think Tina really enjoyed last week's sermon because she might have wanted me to preach it again because the title of today's sermon is the same one that was last week's. <laughs> but I won't be preaching that sermon. I think that once was, was enough and we were all impressed with the word. Uh, but yes, uh, I will not be preaching about Job, a type of Jacob's time of trouble. Uh, the sermon for today is about the, the, the purpose of fasting, okay? The purpose of fasting. So before we start, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for this lovely morning, uh, for the beautiful blessings that we are bestowed, and for the lovely special music that we just enjoyed as well. We thank you for the gifts that you uh, give to your children and allow us to be more uh, effective in your ministry. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Uh, before I begin, there's an announcement. Uh, in regard to the donations uh, for Western Alaska, if you want to donate or, or know of somebody that wishes to uh, donate items, you can drop them off here at church uh, or at the conference building. Okay, they're always open and, and well, I think their hours are Monday through Fridays. Um, I, I, I'm not sure the, the schedule there, but yeah, Monday through Friday, some, sometime during the afternoon would work. Uh, but yes. If you have donations here or the conference building, we'll work for that. Uh, but yes, the purpose of fasting. Nowadays, uh, we pray, and, and it's good to pray. I, I like to see that the church is in praying. Uh, but a lot of us forget that usually what comes hand-to-hand -hand, uh, with prayer is the act of fasting, the, the, the exercise of fasting. Now, I want you to think and reflect on your own. When was the last time that you actually fasted? Uh, don't answer that. That's a rhetorical question. I want you to think about that. When was the last time that you took the time to fast? You know, fasting is a spiritual connection, a deep one that you have with the Lord. And, and for those of you who don't know what fasting is, it's basically you refrain yourself from eating anything uh, uh, for an entire day it can go up to, uh, well, two or three days. It, it really depends on how much you can uh, take. And it's a period of, of prayer and studying God's word and, and worshiping. Um, but what's the purpose of fasting? Why do we fast? Why, why should the Christian feel the need of fasting at all? You know, today's society, today the Christian church... Uh, Hardly anybody fasts anymore. Uh, Richard, uh, Guy M. Richard, who's an executive director at the Systematic Theology uh, Seminary in Atlanta, Georgia, says this about fasting. Fasting is completely out of step with the way the West approaches Christianity and religion as a whole. And because the world has so penetrated the church, this may well be the primary reason why fasting is so unfamiliar to Western Christians in the 21st century. Uh, hardly anybody fasts anymore, and it's a sad reality. But we see moments in the Bible where biblical characters, patriarchs, right, prophets, they fasted. And, and usually when they read that they prayed, fasting is always in that same verse. Some of the people that fasted, uh, Moses, does anybody know how long he fasted for? There's, there's a biblical uh, uh, narrative. Uh, he was in the mountain, and he fasted for 40 days was speaking with God. He was being revealed the Ten Commandments, the laws, right? The Mosaic laws that we know. Esther, along with the Jewish race, they fasted for three days uh, for safety, for deliverance. Daniel fasted to receive an understanding of his vision in Daniel, tw in Daniel 10. 
We also see uh, our Creator, Jesus, He fasted for how long? 40 days, 40 nights in the desert. And that He did before He initiated His ministry. So when was the last time you fasted? Fasting is so crucial in our lives, but hardly, uh, it's hardly practiced anymore. Um, and so when I was thinking about preaching of this topic, uh, there's so many stories and, and so many verses that talk about fasting. But there's a biblical character that I, I, I'm inclined to speak about because his life tends to be uh, one that resonates uh, with me and, and the trials that he faced, the way he responded to them, is something that I admire. Uh, and as many of you know, uh, by reading the, the, the Bible verse, uh, I'm going to speak about David this morning. David is one of the kings, few kings that um, actually had a heart like God's. Uh, and he, whenever something tragic happened in David's life, whenever he sinned, what was his natural response to those situations? Prayer and fasting. That was his natural response. Whenever he was going against an enemy that uh, was strong, he prayed and fasted. Whenever he sinned, he prayed and fasted. That was his automatic response to uh, a lot of situations in his life. But there's a moment, there's a, there, there, there's a certain scene. It, it seems that it allows David to understand what fasting is for. Okay? There's a, mo a, a, a certain moment in his life that reveals to him why fasting uh, should be utilized. And, and what should we learn from fasting as well? So if you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to 2 Samuel 12, uh, and, and, and we're going to focus on, on, on that chapter. 2 Samuel 12, uh, a, a little bit of the story. Uh, David uh, has sinned uh, with, uh, I forget her name in, in English. Uh, what is it? Bathsheba. Bathsheba. Okay, Bathsheba. <laughs> okay. Sometimes I, I preach too much in Spanish that I forget the names in English. Uh, Bathsheba, yes, Bathsheba. Uh, he sinned with Bathsheba, uh, and, and now Nathan it, it comes before David, and he explains to him a parable, right, of a rich man who had a lot of flock, a lot of herds, and he has a visitor come to him. Uh, just like this man has herds and flock, there's also a poor man that has one lamb who he treats like his daughter. And so... Uh, a traveler comes and visits the rich man, and what happens? The rich man is unwilling to take of his own flock and takes the only lamb that this poor man has. And so David, when he hears this, his natural response, he gets infuriated. He's angry. That man deserves death. Little did he know that that poor man uh, represented, who did it represent? Yes. And then who did the rich man represent? King David. King David. So what David did was wrong, right? Sin. He had acted on, on, on his um, pleasure. He had acted on his behalf, and now he had sin in his household. And so now God is going to give his judgment against David. So in verse 11, uh, I'm sorry, verse 10. Let's, let's read from verse 10. Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Okay, here's the first part. Uh, the sword will never depart. From here on after, there's going to be violence, bloodshed in your house, and that's going to continue until you die. That's kind of harsh, right? That's, that's a heavy burden to carry. Uh, and then verse 11, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the son. This sin that David performed, that David committed, it was something that would be... Uh, that, that it would be something that would affect his life entirely until he eventually died. 
We see Absalom, right? He rebelled against his father. There was violence. One of uh, David's sons raped one of his daughters as well. And so this sin opened the doors to various sins as well. But God is not done giving his judgment. He adds on to him something else. Verse 13. Uh, so David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Those who sin, you know, we know that whoever sins and breaks the law, we, we are worthy of death, right? But David has been saved from that. Uh, nevertheless, uh, God is going to do something else. However, because by this deed you have been given great occasion uh, to the enemies, the Lord to, blas to, to blaspheme, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. Then Nathan departed to his house. God had nothing else to say. Nathan had nothing else to say. This is a heavy toll that the sin had. It's a heavy one. And like I said, what was David's natural response to every situation? Prayer and fasting, right? Now imagine this. Um, when we talk about God's will in our lives, it's always something that's beneficial towards us, right? Uh, that it, it, it tends to be good for us. And it's true, God's will uh, at the end of it all, it's, it's towards our benefit. But in moments like these, sometimes God's will, it's something hard to go through with. Because you think of this, you know, if I were to ask, what was God's will in this chapter? Is this judgment not his will as well? It is. So his will in this, ver in this very chapter is that this child die. That's God's will. God didn't want it this way, right? God didn't want David to commit the sin. God, it wasn't in God's plans for, for David to go on and, uh, and lie, betray, murder. It wasn't. But just like this happened, it is now God's will, right? God's will is to keep David as the king uh, and, and, and to teach him a lesson and mold him and perfect him. But it's also his will that this child, right, that was... Con conceived and, and sin, that it may die. And so David, being a father, those who are fathers here, uh, and, and mothers as well, only you know how unconditional and how deep the level of love you have for your children really is. Only you know that. I have yet to experience that. But David uh, knew that his child was going to die. And so the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and it became ill. Here's the thing. Did the child, uh, when it was conceived, was it dead or alive? It was alive. It was alive. When, when it, it came out of uh, the Shiva's womb, it was alive. It was breathing. It cried. It was living. So what did that create in David? A sense of hope. A sense of hope. Now, maybe if I pray and fast, God will change his will. God will change his mind. And so, knowing that the kid, the, 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 the child is still breathing and is still living, David's natural response now is to pray and to fast. And in verse 16, therefore, David pleaded with God for the child. And David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. Usually when people were afflicted back in the days, they would uh, tear their robes. They would uh, lay on, on ashes. They would uh, put dirt on their hair, on their face. They would mourn. They would cry. And this was David now. He wasn't eating. He was crying. He was praying to God, God, please save my child. You have the power. And in verse 17, So the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the ground. But he would not, nor did he eat food with them. For the elders, this wasn't the picture of a king. This wasn't a condition in which a king should be found. You know, a king is meant to uh, maintain his uh, composure, to maintain his posture, uh, to be able to set the example. 
But David doesn't want to hear anything. For him, all he is worried about at the moment is his child. He wants his child to grow up. He wants his child to be able to, he wants to celebrate his first birthday. He wants to see his child get into sports. He wants his child to fall in love, to be married. He wants to have grandchildren through his son. He wants to see a future with his child. And the only one who can cure him of, his, uh, 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 of the illness that the child possesses is God, the one who gave him. And then verse 18, how long did David fast and cry? For seven days, okay? For seven days. A lot of us find prayer to be a tedious thing, something that's hard to do. Uh, and, and that's usually when we're happy. But when we're going through hard and difficult times, for some reason we remember prayer. I think a preacher once uh, mentioned that it's kind of like, a, a, it's like in a glass in a box. It's a, uh, it's a last resort that we break when uh, we eventually need it. But prayer and fasting goes beyond that. It should be done even when we're being blessed by God. And then for seven days, he afflicted his soul. His soul was afflicted. So you might think, right, that a man that prays like this, a man that fasts like this, surely God answers his prayers and his fasting. But what do we read? What happened after the culmination of those seven days? Then on the seventh day, it came to pass that what happened? The child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Indeed, while the child was alive, we spoke to him, and he would not heed our voice. How can we tell him that the child is dead? He may do some harm. So you may ask yourself, what happened here? He did all the right things. He prayed. He fasted. Did God not answer? Doesn't it happen to us sometimes that we're praying, we're fasting, sometimes we pray as a church, uh, 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 as uh, united, and it seems like God doesn't answer the way we want him to. It's very common. What did David wish for? What was he hoping? I mentioned it before. David wished for his son to be saved. That was his will. But well, what was God's will? God's will, what had he proclaimed? What had he declared? What had he stated that this child was going to die? And so through this affliction, right, uh, through this mourning, seven days pass, and he hears his elders, they're, they're kind of murmuring between themselves. They're talking amongst themselves. Uh, and verse 19, when David saw that his servants were whispering, David perceived that the child was dead. Now, what's the human response uh, uh, in obtaining those news? What is the logical response? If his son was ill and this was his condition, imagine how David would respond to him hearing that his son was now dead. Maybe you can imagine a man fasting for another uh, seven days, crying for another seven days, uh, laying on those ashes for seven more days, mourning, crying, tearing up. That's the uh, response that we expect from David. That's what the elders are expecting from David. They're scared that he might do himself more harm. But what happens? What, what's the response that we see from David? Verse 20. So David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself, and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord. And what did he do? He worshipped. Then he went to his own house, and, he w and when he requested, they set food before him, and he ate. He finished fasting as well. Why do we fast? Why should the Christian be fasting and praying constantly? Usually we think of prayer and fasting as something, right, that when we do this, uh, God will will answer the way I want him to. God will 
be inclined to going about my own will. But prayer and fasting isn't for that. Prayer and fasting is to bring us into an environment, a setting of worship. Because it's when we worship that we're able to accept God's will. And this is what David was learning with prayer and fasting. That it wasn't about him, right? That it, it isn't about trying to change God's mind. It's not trying about changing God's will. But it's being able to prepare your heart through prayer and fasting for whatever the Lord has deemed so. For whatever the Lord has declared. For whatever the Lord's will is. That's why we pray and fast. When we have someone that's sick, a loved one, God, we pray and fast, not so that God can heal him, but that whatever God decides, that my heart and spirit may be ready to accept what he has declared. That's why we pray and fast. And yes, maybe God will heal and praise the Lord, but what if God doesn't heal? Praise the Lord. Be able to accept God's will. That's why we pray and fast. David, knowing that his child died, what did he do? He worshipped God. And that's where Philippians 4, 7 answers, and the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding will guard your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. The peace that surpasses all human understanding Verse 21, then his servant said to him, What is this that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive, but when the child died, you arose and ate food. And he said, While the child was alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me and the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? I can't change anything. Even though my will wants something else, I can't change it. I can't do anything to, to, to change the circumstances I'm in. I can only accept it. That's all I can do. Can I bring him back again? David knew he didn't have that power. But here's something amazing. I love this verse. I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. David knew uh, that he eventually... He would die, uh, and, 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 and that, that would be the end of it all, right? But that would be the end of his pain and suffering here in this world. But he also was holding on to a promise here. I shall go to him. I shall go to him. He was thinking of the resurrection day. That's what he was thinking of when he was saying this. I can't do anything about my son anymore, but I can focus on myself, on trying to do my best to get to that day, to get to resurrection day, to, to do everything I possibly can with God's help and God's aid to be able to be united with my son once again. I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. God's will for us is sometimes painful. It's true. Pain and suffering is a megaphone God utilizes to arouse the deaf world. That's what C.S. Lewis wrote once. The will of God will never take you to where the grace of God will not protect you. And so just as God allowed this to happen in David's life, God was also there to comfort him, to mourn with him. And then David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went, uh, went into her and lay with her. So she bore a son, and he called his name Solomon. Now the Lord loved him. God blessed David after this experience with another child. The future king of Israel as well. A man who would become the wisest man of, of all history. You know, there hasn't been any... Uh, wiser than Solomon or never will there be anybody wiser than Solomon God's will for us it's always for the good but in certain moments right it's hard to understand that it's hard to understand why God allows certain things to happen in our lives 
And when it's hard for us to understand it or, or to be able to see the bigger picture, that's when we pray and we fast. God, help me understand. Help me to accept your will. Bring me, give me a spirit of worship. When everything's going down, when your world's falling down and it's plundering, what does Satan want? What is the natural response that Satan expects from you? What the elders expected. More crying, more depression. But when you're fasting and you're praying, you worship God. Even if, 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 if everything around you is crumbling down, you still worship and you pray. We fast so we can prepare our hearts and our minds to accept God's will. You know, David is an amazing persona, an amazing biblical character. Because it was this moment that he realized, right, that God's will is something I can only accept, I cannot change. And so I want you to think, what is God trying to do in your life? What is God's will for your life right now? Are you in a place where you can accept that at this moment? Are you in a moment, uh, in a situation where you can prepare yourself for whatever God is going to say to you? God speaks to us every day. We need to worship God to be, in a, to be able to recognize His will, to be able to hold on to His promises, to be able to... Uh, Maintain ourselves motivated, encouraged. That's why we worship. Why do you come here every Sabbath? Why do you come and worship uh, 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 and sing praises? Why? It's in worship, worshiping God, that I find motivation, strength, encouragement. That's why I worship. It's when I have my uh, uh, personal connection with God. For Moses... Fasting prepared for him to receive the Ten Commandments. For Esther, it prepared his, uh, the nation's heart to be delivered. For Daniel, it prepared him to understand, you know, what the prophecies meant. And for Jesus, fasting, it prepared his heart, his mind, his soul for the ministry which he was about to embark in. Fasting strengthens us in a powerful way. And it's sad that it's not being utilized uh, in a manner which God wishes us to use it. And so I asked each one of you today, when was the last time you fasted? Think about that. Identify the problem and resolve it. Don't wait for somebody to tell you, hey, let's fast. Don't wait for the church to have a special day to fast. Fasting is something you can do on your own, right? Because uh, prayer should be done, right, on your own as well. It's nice when we get together, but don't rely or depend on that. Be a Christian that has discipline, that is able to do it, right? Because there's a need, because you know you rely on these things to be able to push yourself forward. So on this morning, my invitation for each one of you it's to take the time, maybe out of this week, but fast. Fast in a way which you can prepare your heart for whatever God is trying to tell you. There's various methods of fasting. Whatever distracts you from God, abstain yourself from that. Whatever distracts you from God, abstain yourself from that. So on this lovely morning, that's my invitation to you. That's my challenge for you. Fast. Pray, worship God, so you can accept His will in your life. Blessings.